The crisp morning air embraced me as I tightened the straps on my backpack, preparing for our daring patrol into the uncharted territory of Yellowstone National Park. I was part of a team of park rangers who was tasked with exploring the untouched depths of the wilderness, mapping new trails and ensuring the safety of both visitors and wildlife. With a mixture of excitement and caution, we set off into the dense forest, the towering trees forming a majestic canopy above us. Each step echoed through the serene silence, our boots crushing twigs and leaves beneath them. The beauty of nature surrounded us, but so did the untamed mysteries that lay hidden within. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, our senses sharpened, our eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of disturbance. Suddenly, a faint cry broke through the stillness of the forest. We exchanged glances, our instincts alerting us to something amiss. Following the anguished sound, we stumbled upon an injured camper, his face etched with pain and fear. Blood stained his clothes, and his trembling hands clutched a makeshift bandage over a deep gash on his arm. We rushed to his side, offering assistance and asking what had befallen him. His voice quivered as he recounted his terrifying encounter. He described a creature, massive and hairy, with eyes that seemed to penetrate his very soul. It resembled the Bigfoot, a creature often dismissed as folklore. Skepticism flickered in our eyes, but empathy compelled us to listen further. The injured camper revealed how the creature attacked him without warning, its strength overwhelming. He fought back with all his might, desperately struggling to free himself from its grip. In a stroke of desperation, he managed to strike a blow that sent the beast sprawling. Believing it to be dead, he escaped, but the trauma had clouded his memory of the exact location. Our gazes shifted between disbelief and concern. Could it be possible? Were we standing face to face with evidence of a creature? We assessed the situation, weighing our duty to the injured camper against the unknown dangers that lurked in the depths of the park. Realizing that his life hung in the balance, we made a collective decision to prioritize his well-being. Carefully, we helped him to his feet, supporting his wounded arm. Navigating through the wilderness, our group communicated with a local hospital, arranging for an immediate transfer of the injured camper. The journey was arduous. We formed a protective shield around him, ensuring his safety as we traversed the untamed terrain. Finally reaching the edge of the wilderness, we handed him over to the waiting medical professionals. Exhausted, yet satisfied that we had fulfilled our duty, we watched as he was whisked away to receive the urgent care he needed. Though skeptical of his encounter, we couldn't shake off the nagging curiosity that lingered within us. I work as a broadcast engineer. One night in September 2015, I received a phone call around 9.30, 10-ish p.m. from the on-duty engineer that our OTA over-the-air signal had gone out and we were off the air on our OTA platform. The call was with several other engineers as well as my boss at the time. We figured out that the problem was at our transmitter and must be corrected manually. My boss asked for someone to volunteer to go with him, and after a few seconds of awkward silence I offered. So our RF transmitter site was located on top of Beacon Mountain in Beacon, New York which was about an hour plus from our station. At the time, I had never been up there so going in the middle of the night was a little spooky. I met my boss and we drove together, got to the mountain a little before midnight. The road up the mountain to the transmitter site is a long, narrow, windy and steep dirt road with a lot of big loose rocks, so the drive up and down is scary enough. I can't emphasize enough how dark this drive was. Like pitch black. A few times while going up we would see headlights coming towards us of people out with their off-road jeeps. Which wouldn't be as weird if it weren't the middle of the night. We also saw two different campfires deep in the woods which I just assumed were groups of locals hanging out drinking. My boss told me that locals hung out near the transmitter site sometimes and should be avoided as they had a tendency to be sketchy. It didn't seem too sketchy to me, but what did I know, it was my first time there. 
My boss also told me that he never travels to that mountain without a gun. He said it's more than the locals. I've seen stuff out here I can't really explain. We get to the top, do our work on our transmitter, close everything up, and start to head back down. As we were heading down, we were at a particularly steep part of the road when you have to ride your brake because the car won't stop till the incline levels out a little. All of a sudden, three deer sprint out in front of us, not even looking at our oncoming car causing us to swerve since we were already riding the brake. The front of the car hit a rock which stopped our momentum. My boss instantly turned the car off and once the sound of the engine died we heard something big run the opposite direction away from the road up the natural slope of the hill. I shined my flashlight in the direction but whatever it was was already out of sight. We could still see branches moving and leaves settling from being disturbed by whatever ran away. I asked my boss if he thought that was another deer or possibly a bear and he replied, Bears run on all fours, whatever that was ran on two legs. And bears don't hunt deer, something was chasing them. When we first heard the footsteps, I would estimate they were as close as 10-15 feet from the car when it started to run away, but appeared to be standing over us, as there was a natural incline up the mountain. There are a few logical explanations like that my boss was just trying to scare me or that it was a local walking, running through the woods, but here are a few things to consider. Yes, it could have been a person walking alone through the woods, but why chase the deer? And why run away from the car? Also, whatever ran away was out of sight quickly, like within three, four seconds of starting to run up the hill. This person would have to be in the greatest shape ever to run that quickly up this hill. This also sounded way too big to be a bobcat, mountain lion, or coyote. My boss is not the kind of guy that would try to scare people. He's a very stern all-business type of guy. He seemed pretty rattled by this and wanted to get off the mountain ASAP. He later confided in me that he thought it may have been a Bigfoot. I ended up going back up that mountain many more times before leaving for a new job, and I never saw or heard anything like that night. However, I never went back after sunset. I no longer work for this company, and this company no longer owns the transmitter site, so I will likely never have a reason to go back. I don't know of any reported sightings or experiences in the area, but I do know that over the years there have been many car accidents on that road. I assume all the accidents are due to the poor condition of it, but honestly, I have no idea. The year was 1970. I worked for Caltrans as a right-of-way agent for the state of California. I was taking some legal documents over to Bakersfield to have a county judge sign. I was traveling on Route 58 west of Mojave towards Bakersfield and east of Tehachapi in my 1957 Chevrolet State Car. A state highway maintenance crew was repairing the westbound lanes. Traffic was stopped in these two lanes for up to 15 minutes. I pulled right off of the highway to a dirt and gravel turnout and backed up to a low-level brush and rock area with no dirt roads behind me. I sat in the car for a few minutes and decided to take a look at the documents I was taking to Bakersfield for the judge. Before I got the documents out, I noticed something in my rear view's mirror and turned to see what it was. I was amazed to see a vehicle directly behind my car with two individuals wearing grey-white suits. Mine was the only car on the turnout. No car could have possibly gone around the front or the back without me seeing or hearing it. There was no sound at all. I continued to look directly at the car and individuals directly through the back window. The car was maroon in color with a dark top. The grille looked similar to an older Buick. The license plate was light in color with no discernible markings. The two individuals in the car as stated wore jump type suits with no buttons. They were slender with no visible hat or hair and their bodies appeared to be smaller than the average sized man. Their eyes were very dark and semi-oval, little larger than a normal human. They stared at me and never blinked. They both had two small holes for their nose, very small mouths, no lips and I couldn't see any ears. 
nor could I see their arms due to their car hood hiding over half of their bodies. After a few minutes of staring at each other, I noticed light traffic starting to slowly move on the highway again to the west, so I drove from my parking area out to the paved highway going towards Backersfield again. The highway's westbound lanes were now open for the public. I was driving about normal speed in the right-hand lane, just west of where the state construction was. Looking to my left I saw a maroon car driving at my speed, parallel to me with the same individuals I had seen at the turnout. The driver looked continuously to the front. I immediately noticed that he had no nose and he was bald. The passenger in the car was again staring directly at me. We drove parallel to each other for about 15 seconds. I didn't know what to do, so I waved my hand at them as if to say goodbye. They immediately sped down the highway and disappeared around a moderate curve to the right. I sped up to try and see the maroon car again, but it had disappeared. There were rather steep rock cliffs on the right side and no place to turn off the highway. The next day driving from Bakersfield to Bishop, I stopped at the same turnout of my first encounter and went to the same spot. I saw my tire tracks from the previous day but saw no other tracks behind mine. Wow, as you might deduce I've never breathed a word of these happenings for decades to anyone for fear of being ridiculed. I've mulled over this experience many times over the years. This is my true story of a very strange, mysterious, and profound event. Lately, I've been seeing a lot more stories on Reddit about Yaoi sightings and encounters. So I myself was driving home one evening and saw something that disturbed me to my core. Myself and two fellow officers were driving down this country road towards the station. It was maybe right about one in the morning after a very long shift. The roads can be pretty dangerous sometimes, and we're always on high alert for anything out of the ordinary. We spotted something up ahead near an old abandoned building, so we slowed down to see what it was. It was the movement that caught our eye. As we got closer, I realized it was not any animal we'd ever seen. It was tall, bipedal, hairy, with big eyes, and had claws like a bear. But it clearly was not a bear. But like a bear, it also stood upright. It was just standing there, looking right at us. It did not have any clothes on either, so I was pretty rattled. We pulled up about several hundred feet away, stopped to get a better look at it. We knew this wasn't one of the new aliens they're always talking about. This was something else. Though I will admit, we're all fairly seasoned officers, this thing really spooked us. Enough that one of my fellow officers turned around right then, drove off without saying anything to me or my other friend. He must have had his reasons that he took off. While we were still in the process of trying to find out what happened, this thing began making strange sounds. We'd try to get a closer look, but we felt too afraid to get closer. I feel like had we gotten out of the car and gone up the hill to where this was, whatever that thing was, it would have attacked us. Was it a yaoi? It just had this sort of dangerous demeanor about it. So we decided to leave it. Instead, I'm kind of glad my partner took off. I think he knew something I did not back then. I know for sure now, though. Cryptids are real, and yaoi is one of them for sure. In fact, my childhood friend saw another one years ago in the forest near his home. Once we were young teenagers, he's been trying to convince me ever since that all those other stories we've heard are probably true. I guess we know that he was right about at least some of them. I don't know what's going on, but I'm glad to see there are others out there like me and my friend who believe in these creatures and are not afraid to speak out about it. It's time we get the word out that they are real. People need to recognize this kind of thing is happening every day all around us, even if most people can't see it or just simply refuse to accept it. That and stop perpetuating the stories and rumors about Sasquatch and Bigfoot being demons or something. We know better than that by now, right? I'm Akita, Sioux native that had this terrifying encounter with an unknown predator. 
so I grew up in the heart of the Appalachians, near a dense and mysterious woodland. My closest companion in this wilderness was Red Bull, a fearless and adventurous friend who shared my curiosity for the unknown. One fateful day, after a successful bison hunt, Red Bull and I decided to venture deeper into the woods in search of the carcass we had left behind. As we made our way through the underbrush, a sudden chill swept through the forest, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. I exchanged a wary glance with Red Bull, both of us sensing an eerie presence lurking nearby. The familiar sounds of the woods seemed to fade into an unnatural silence. Then we saw it. Emerging from the darkness was a figure unlike anything we had ever encountered. It stood tall on its two hind legs, its elongated arms brushing against the ground like a bear in disguise. The creature's gaunt frame gave an impression of extreme malnourishment, with a crooked spine that contorted its form. Its face was a grotesque sight, lacking the majestic horns of a bull, but adorned with a tangled mane of neck hair. Its skin, bathed in the ethereal glow of moonlight, shimmered with a haunting gray hue, and its eyes glowed with an unnatural, piercing light. My heart pounded in my chest as I locked eyes with this monstrous cryptid. Its presence sent a shiver down my spine, and I could feel the weight of its gaze penetrating my very soul. In sheer terror, Red Bull and I turned and ran for our lives. Our pounding footsteps echoed through the forest, accompanied by the echoing howls of the creature in pursuit. It seemed relentless, its unearthly speed closing in on us. But just as it drew dangerously close, an inexplicable change came over the creature. It abruptly ceased its pursuit, losing interest in our escape. Breathless and trembling, we reached the safety of our tribe's encampment. We dared not speak of what we had witnessed, fearing that our story would be met with disbelief or worse, that it would invite the creature's return. We sought solace in each other's silence, yet the memory of that nightmarish encounter haunted our thoughts. About ten years ago my family and I were doing some fishing four-wheeling in the back country of Colorado. This R is well out of cell phone range and we have been here multiple times before. We usually split up into groups of two, one kid with each parent. We each have a small walkie-talkie to communicate with the other group. My mom and I got out of the jeep and proceed to start fishing in the creek, and not three minutes later we get a bear and bear cub by the river we are coming back to pick you up over the radio which is nothing new. We see bears quite often. So my mom and I hightail it back to the road and hop in the jeep. We drive a few miles up river before we decide to head out again and fish. Well, we have our full day of fishing and start to head out of the area, and on the way out about two or three feet off of the road is an aspen tree stump that had been chain-sawed of at some point. Standing on the stump was the bear cub, just hanging out playing on its own. We don't see mama bear, so we decide to drive by it. Even if we did see her, we would just take off down the road. So I have a disposable camera and we stop for a quick moment to take a few pictures of it. I am literally close enough to touch it. We all stare in amazement because we have never seen a bear cub this close. So naturally we develop the pictures. The pictures have the background, the tree stump, the road, everything in perfect focus but no bear. Everyone in my family saw the bear and we have no idea what happened. We all refer to it as the ghost bear. I write this account with a heavy heart, a tale born from the shadows of a mission that blurred the lines between duty and the haunting specters of war. We were a Navy SEAL sniper team deployed behind enemy lines in Israel, working in tandem with Israeli commandos. Our objective was clear gather intel, disrupt enemy operations, and remain unseen in the unforgiving landscapes of Gaza. Days turned into nights, and nights into endless stretches of silence, as we lay concealed in the shadows, our camouflage blending seamlessly with the harsh terrain. The psychological toll of remaining hidden, observing the ebb and flow of life on the other side, 
was as exhausting as any physical demand our training had prepared us for. My gaze remained fixed through the scope, observing the eons old dance between the cities. The sounds of distant prayers mixed with the occasional bursts of gunfire echoed through the air. It was an eerie symphony, a testament to the perpetual struggle that unfolded beyond our hidden vantage point. One moonlit night, the tranquility shattered. A whisper in the wind carried tales of an enemy sniper, a phantom in Gaza known for his mind games. His reputation preceded him, tales of psychological warfare that left adversaries questioning their own sanity. The silence morphed into a surreal anticipation as we became aware of an unseen adversary playing a deadly game of cat and mouse. Days turned into sleepless nights, with each member of our sniper team taking turns on watch. We felt the unseen eyes of the enemy, a disconcerting presence that transcended the physical realm. Shadows seemed to move independently, and every shift in the wind carried a threat we couldn't quite grasp. Then it happened. A shot, distant yet thunderous, echoed through the silence. The bullet narrowly missed one of our own, a chilling reminder that we were not alone in the darkness. The mind games had begun. As the days passed, the psychological warfare escalated. Whispers in the dark, shapes that danced at the edge of our vision, and the relentless anticipation of an unseen adversary weighed on our minds. The line between friend and foe blurred in the obsidian night. Survival became our only mission. The enemy sniper, elusive as a phantom, kept us on edge, wondering if the next step we took would be our last. It was a game of wits, and we were pawns in a deadly chess match played on the borders of war. In the end, we survived but the scars were etched not just on our bodies, but on our souls. As I looked out over the contested land, I couldn't help but wonder what our encounter with the elusive sniper impact the overall war between Israel and Palestine. Was the psychological trauma we endured a microcosm of the larger, enduring struggle that echoed through the ages? The war continued, a relentless force that swept through the land like an unyielding tide. Our mission was a drop in the vast ocean of conflict, a story whispered in the hidden corners of a war-torn world. As I left the shadows behind, I carried the weight of those days with me, wondering if our encounter with a phantom sniper would ripple through the annals of history, a fleeting moment in the eternal dance between nations. My cousin and I were on our way home from an event one evening and decided to take the lake roads home because it was dusk and we knew the lake would look so pretty and serene. The particular lake we drove around is still decently surrounded by the woods, so there are lots of dense areas. We were driving past this giant field next to the lake that was lined with trees or woods on three sides when she screamed at me to stop the car and back up. Her scream practically made me jump out of my skin, but I agreed and backed up confused. She looked all frantic so I asked her why she made us back up, and she claimed she saw some kind of animal, but it wasn't a normal animal. She said it was standing on its back legs like a bear, and that it was huge and covered in white fur. Whatever it was wasn't there by the time we'd backed up. She's kind of a skeptical person and I'm more of the one who believes in the crazy stuff, so seeing her so freaked out had me thinking she definitely had to have seen something. And I knew there was a legend of the Lake Worth monster in that general area that dates back to, I think, maybe the 60s, so my brain immediately jumped on that. The next time I saw her, we both got on Google so she could see what comes up when you type that in. I'll never forget the way her mouth dropped open. She claimed it looked just like what she saw. This was a few years ago when this happened so I don't know if other people have had any recent experiences or not because I haven't heard anything. But it's something I'll definitely never forget. I was walking through a majestic redwoods forest in California, soaking in the tranquility and beauty of nature. Little did I know that my peaceful hike would take a dramatic turn, plunging me into a heart-pounding encounter that would leave me questioning everything. 
As I strolled along the winding path, the forest embraced me with its towering trees and the gentle rustling of leaves. Suddenly, a noise shattered the serene ambience, jolting me from my reverie. My senses heightened and my heart skipped a beat. Something was approaching, something fast. Before I could react, a massive figure burst into view, sprinting at an incredible speed. It was a Bigfoot. In those fleeting seconds, the enormity of the situation struck me, and fear gripped my every thought. My rifle, resting casually on my shoulder, was now a stark reminder of my vulnerability. It remained there, untouched and useless, as the Bigfoot swiftly disappeared into the depths of the woods. The encounter happened so abruptly and unexpectedly that there was no chance for me to raise my weapon and defend myself. The realization sent shivers down my spine. But what perplexed me even more was the reason behind the Bigfoot's panic. What could have scared such a creature? Its wild sprint through the forest conveyed a sense of urgency, as if it was fleeing from something relentless. The creature seemed completely unbothered by my presence, as if humans were inconsequential in its world. My mind raced with questions. What unknown danger had crossed paths with the Bigfoot? Was there a larger threat lurking in the depths of the forest, unseen and menacing? I couldn't help but feel a mixture of awe, curiosity, and deep unease. My dad, in 1978, was a Portland, Oregon policeman for 30 years. And once a year I went with him while he did his police work for a book report at school or something. I was 12. He worked on the graveyard shift, coming home at four in the morning, about seven miles north of Hubbard, Oregon. We lived down a gravel road about one mile from a school. It was all gravel, but it was long enough for two cars to go past each other, and we were just, you know, half asleep but awake. He and I both saw something leap across the road as if it had already been running. It jumped onto the whole road, which was at least ten feet wide. It didn't even step into the middle. It jumped off the edge of the ditch and right into the orchard next to where we lived. I looked at my dad and he looked at me. He was a very quiet man, but we just said, what was that about? We got to the house and parked the car in the driveway, and we were both running trying to get through the door as fast as we could. When I went to bed that night, I felt like it was morning because I was so anxious. I told my sister that we're moving my bunk beds to the far wall away from the window. Afterward, I didn't talk to anyone except my mom, and I didn't have any close friends and school was out. But then it happened again. A week later, a doctor in his small red Volkswagen drove down the same road towards town. He saw the same thing and was so scared that he stopped at the police station. Of course, that got out, and it was written up in the paper and all that. It looked just like the Patterson one referring to the Bigfoot creature filmed by Roger Patterson, except that it had lighter hair. Back when my mom was in the hospital, I stayed with her for five days. She was on the sixth floor, whereas the food court and snack machines were on the basement floor. I live in a small town so our hospital is the only one with six floors. I rode up and down the elevator so much that I knew this place like the back of my hands. Anyway, one day I went down to get a drink and a Kit Kat. Everything was normal except the Coke machine card reader didn't work. When I got off the elevator on the sixth floor, there were just empty walls. There are no nurses' stations, no rooms, no painting, no furniture, nothing. I walked towards one end to see random size white buildings and the other end to see tall skyscrapers and a shiny metal window type building. I called out over and over but no one replied. I walked to the elevator stop and they were missing. I took out my phone to call the hospital to tell them I was lost, but my phone didn't have any bars this was years ago with flip phones. I kept looking at the windows hoping to find some sort of person to alert but no one was down there. No cars for miles. After realizing I was literally screwed, panic attacks kicked in. 
I sat on the floor, staring at the wall, trying to calm myself down for a half hour. When I woke up, the place looked the same except for the elevators. They were back and I sighed of relief. I got in, pushed to the fifth floor of the maternity ward, and the doors shut. When they opened, there were the basic light-colored walls, borders trimmed with cute duckies, and the sounds of people talking and babies crying. I found the fire escape and figured I'd take my chances on getting to mom's floor. I opened the door and I was back on the sixth floor, the real one. I walked into mom's room and she said that was fast. I told her I must have been gone for over an hour, but she said I had been gone for less than five minutes. I looked at the TV and the bold and the beautiful was still on it's a 30 minute show. I don't know what happened to me or where I was, but I still don't trust elevators. This one time I was swimming in Lake Michigan. It was late at night and I just had a few beers before jumping off my uncle's boat for a swim. I was in the water for maybe five minutes and my uncle and cousin shined the spotlight on me. I will never forget the look of sheer terror on their faces and the yelling that ensued. I felt something slimy wrap around my leg and torso and I started thrashing violently. I managed to get back into the boat and on looking back I saw the biggest, meanest looking bunch of kelp I had ever seen. To this day no one knows what happened to my uncle and cousin. I was asleep one night in December of 2012 at my home in Montgomery, Alabama. I had been experiencing a deep fascination with UFO phenomena, questioning reality, and a deep spiritual awakening. I felt as if I had had similar experiences in my youth to what I'm about to describe, but could never really remember details as I do with this episode. Keep in mind I'm a mother and a professional and do not want to be deemed as crazy. I have only shared this info with my husband right after it happened. I felt as if I was dreaming and I was back in my childhood home several miles from where I actually was. In the dream I woke up and wandered outside as if I was being called to do so. I was then in my former neighbor's front yard. There was a silver disc with three wonderful human-like beings. One felt male and the other two felt female. This was a sort of telepathic feeling. I just sensed who they were and they felt familiar to me almost like meeting long-lost relatives. They emanated an incredible feeling of peace, love and other things that I just cannot put into words. They ushered me into the craft. We ascend straight up. I don't really know what was going on outside the craft, although it did not ascend by any means we know of today. The craft itself was operated by one of the female beings. The craft seemed to know her. The male and other females sat on either side of me. We had a deep conversation about life existence and our purpose here on Earth. We then arrived wherever where. I have no idea where. Again just felt familiar. We exited the craft and we were inside of a building. There were many more beings of the same type. The area was large, very beautiful and bright. There was an enormous sitting area where we continued to discuss very deep subject matter. The other entities were also communicating it was like a council or a meeting. I felt such incredible love that I did not want to leave. Suddenly they told me that I had to come back that I would be okay and they would always be with me. I suddenly woke up in my bed. I dismissed it as a lovely dream. A couple days later while checking my mailbox I noticed a circular pattern in the grass in my front yard. The grass was bent over much like you would see in a crop circle. I asked my husband what it was and he had no idea. Then I realized that the dream I had actually occurred and the craft had landed in my front yard. I told my husband about this and of course he dismissed it. We only talked about it again recently. It came up in conversation and I said what could have caused the indentation and I wished I had taken a picture to which he replied we should have had the soil sampled. He admitted that when I first showed him the first thought he had was UFO and then after telling him the story he was so internally shaken up he couldn't think about it. 
Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.